Please, please have a seat. Let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. So we read that God created man in his own image. God imparted his own image to that first man. Genesis chapter 2 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were fulfilled and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because that in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. From this seventh verse, I'd like to point out to you what I mentioned last night that Man is a complex combination of two realms, two worlds, two substances. He is made of the dust of the ground and the very breath of God, matter and spirit. But man also reflects the triunity of God and that we are a trichotomy. We are a trifold being, we are spirit, we are matter, and our soul, our mind and general consciousness exists between those two sides of our being, and we must choose to live as a spirit, a soul, and a body, not living as an animal, a body, but a soul and a spirit that is dead. Much of humanity lives in that state. Much of humanity lives like just an intelligent animal, which they are you know, convinced that they are. It's not the plan of God for us. So all that is written in Romans chapter 8 about being spiritually minded. To be spiritually minded is life and peace, but to be carnally minded is death. So what side of our being do we allow to be sort of dominant? For the Christian, we have been set right side up and we live uprightly. We are, in fact, spiritually alive now. And as people who are spiritually alive, we must live spiritually minded. The life of being led by the Holy Spirit. But to be carnally, carnally minded, to be completely consumed with the material side of us and this world is death. We are, in the words of the quotable C.S. Lewis, we are amphibious. We're like some of the amphibious creatures of the animal kingdom that are at home on land and at home in the water. Well, we are at home in the material realm, but also in the spiritual realm. I say it again, we are men, we are women. We stand on two feet on the earth, looking up to, reaching for, thinking of, of heaven and of heavenly things. 
if you have a dog, you and your dog take a walk together, as I do with my dog. My four-legged friend is only consumed in all of his thinking with earth. What is on earth for him to taste, to smell, touch, hear, see, to interact with. When we stand on a mountain and we look out, I don't think he even looks out over the sky. He doesn't even know there is a sky. He doesn't look at the sunset and admire the beauty. Most of the animals, and certainly the dog is in this category, they don't even see in color. They see black and white. Vision is not their primary sense anyway. So the dog does not ever stand on his two feet and reach his paws to heaven to praise or to even wonder. He doesn't have a philosophical question about why am I here? Why do I live? What is my purpose? And what is beyond all of this? He doesn't have those thoughts. He doesn't look at the sunset and wonder who painted that. He doesn't. He's a dog. You may have friends who live that same way. They don't give a single deep thought to why they live. They want to be lost in the pursuit of whatever pleasure they can find in their brief earthly experience before they die. And in their thinking, they'll cease to exist. But they're wrong. We're spirit beings. Spirit doesn't cease to exist. Spirit never goes into oblivion. So anyway, uh, spirit and matter. May I point out to you again, in that seventh verse, that it is the Lord God. It is, in fact, Yahweh, Elohim, who formed man of the dust of the ground, breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. Verse 8, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God, um, out of the ground <laughs> made the Lord God, to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. I want you to look at that one. Every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. A tree that is the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God made all these trees pleasant to the eye. Good for food, and also the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 10, and the river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is it that compasses the whole land of Hebelah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. And there is Bedlam, and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is that that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekel, and that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. On that note, all of you have, most of you have, a cell phone. And with that cell phone, you have access to the World Wide Web. And with the World Wide Web, you have access to YouTube. I want to highly recommend, you should make a note of this, Expedition Bible. Archaeologist and brother in the Lord, Joel Kramer, he does a lot of uh, documentaries on the various archaeological sites 
all over Israel and outside of Israel, in Mesopotamia in general. All of the archaeology that validates the record of Scripture. And he does a really good documentary on the location of Eden based on the description that we just read. A documentary complete with very thorough aerial photography from a drone uh, with a camera that his son runs. You really ought to see that. It will show you <laughs> climate, climate change. Well, that's been happening for a long time. There's no paradise underneath the camera on that drone. The region is just all part of the vast Sahara. The world has been under the effects of the curse of sin for a very long time. It's hard to believe that the region today is referred to as the Fertile Crescent. From history, the very birthplace, birthplace of civilization, it's desert. So climate change isn't new. It's been happening for a very long time. There's no Eden there. And the world has undergone its changes. But we, we read on. And here, in verse 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Literally translated from Hebrew, it is, and dying you will die. On the day that you eat of it, you will experience death. What is death, according to the Bible? Death is not non-existence. Death equals separation. Death equals separation. To be physically dead is for your spirit and your body to be separated. Those two sides of your being severed. But to be spiritually dead is to be separated, alienated, relationally from God, the source of life. So a person who is spiritually dead and dies physically stays permanently, eternally separated from God. Eternal death that will never, ever end. So we only have the opportunity to end that separation between us and God, while we are physically alive. For as it is written, it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. May I say to you also, in the words of C.S. Lewis, when the whole program of God is done, there will only be two kinds of people. All of humanity will be in one category or the other, not just heaven and hell. There'll be two kinds of people. There'll be those people that have said to God, thy will be done. And what is God's will? That we would be his child. We would live with him together forever. Versus those people to whom God says, thy will be done. You wanted none of me, have it your way. So God honors the free moral agency of every single spirit that he created. So I say again, only two kinds of people. Those who will say to God, thy will be done, versus those to whom God will say, thy will be done. Separation was your choice. Have it your way forever. Now, God 
gave the simple command to the man, thou mayest freely eat of everything, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not. It's not that you may not, it is that you shall not. Now clearly, Adam is free, in a sense, to do his own will and to eat of that which God commanded him not to eat. He can actually do it. We know that because he will do it. He is not bound in the sense that he, it's not like he's incapable of reaching for the forbidden fruit and eating it. He's quite capable. God has given him an arm that will work. It will reach even to that which God has told him not to eat. So the concept of freedom that God introduces us to is a concept where we are free to choose, but we must weigh carefully our choices because there are consequences. Well, what happens now? Verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. It was God who said it was not good. Up until this moment, everything that God has done in creation, every stage, every phase of creation is good, even very good. We come to this moment. God said, it's not good that he should be alone. I will make him a helper. Please, now, allow me to point out to you what is not written. Let me point out to you what God did not do. God did not repeat the seventh verse where he had formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God did not repeat Genesis 2, 7 to make the woman. Now, that's kind of significant. I make, I make much of it. I make much of what God did not do. I, I make much of what he did not do that he could have done. He didn't do. God did not, I'm going to say it again, he did not form her of the dust of the ground and then breathe into her nostrils the birth of life and she become a living soul and then present her to the man. He did not do that. May I also point out to you that it was God himself who was aware of the man's need to not be alone. Even, I think, before the man was aware. It was God who knew his need and was going to do something about it. And before addressing the man's need, verse 19 says, And out of the ground... The Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. Whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. Now that is not an implication that God was looking for a helper comparable to him. God already said, I will make him a helper. No, what we have here, brothers and sisters, is God engages his son, Adam, in a great, huge, worldwide project. God engages him in something that is meaningful. Something I believe also that is wonderful. The, um, the study of all these created life forms and all of their uniqueness, the wonder of the genius of God displayed in every one of those creatures. I believe it was a, a, 
a, a father-son project where God, Yahweh, the Father, brings these creatures to the man. They say, what will you call them? How will you categorize them? So Adam is the first. He's the original zoologist. He's the original botanist. Every field of science. Because the command had been given to him to multiply, master, and manage. Have dominion. So he, Adam, was commissioned by God to study and to play the part of identifying naming. And in the process, listen to me on, on this one, in the process, there's no doubt in my mind that God is accomplishing two things with the man. Number one, oh, he's introducing him to the concept of family. Introducing him to the concept of gender, of sexes. The concept of reproduction, of life coming from life. From life coming from seed. God is introducing Adam to the concept of family even among the animals. Secondly, no doubt in my mind, God is showing the man his uniqueness, that there's nothing like him. There's nothing like him. There is not another being out there in the entire world of living creatures that think and feel and choose. There's nothing that thinks and feels toward God. There is no other creature made for fellowship with God. It is not merely that there's nothing else as intelligent as the man. No, it's, it's, it's deeper than that. God is showing the man his uniqueness. I'll tell you what I, I believe also. He's heightening, I guess that would be a third thing, right? He's heightening the man's anticipation. Heightening his wondering. What might God have for me? Who might he have for me? Every single one of us, well, with maybe just a few exceptions, there are a few very unique people that are born in every generation that don't have that longing, that don't have that need. And there's a freedom that is connected to that, that they may enjoy. There are eunuchs among us, some who were born that way. According to the Son of God, there are other eunuchs who choose to make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. But the rest of us, the vast majority of us, we wondered, or we wonder still, who might God have for us? We have a longing in our heart to become one with someone, to share life, to know love, deep and lasting love. And maybe even to see life come out of that love. Where did that come from? Where did this longing come from? It comes from the fact that we're made in the image of God. We love because he loved. We're made with that capacity. Now, I'll add to that. We also hate because he hates. We're made in his image. Hmm. Western culture has gotten profoundly stupid. And in their stupidity, Europe and America, Western Europe has embraced the notion that all love is good and all hate is bad. Could anything be as stupid as that? There is such a thing as wrong love, and there is such a thing as right hate. As a matter of fact, I maintain that love and hate belong together. 
Because you and I will, in fact, hate anything that threatens the object of our love. We love and we hate because we're made in God's image. We are commanded in the scriptures, ye that love the Lord, hate evil. Hate is fitting. Hate can be righteous. Now, of course, not all hate is right and not all love is right. Not all hate is wrong and not all love is wrong. But there is such a thing as wrong love and there is such a thing as right hate. We had a longing in our heart. I believe Adam had one and God is the one who is sort of stimulating that. In fact, I believe that God caused Adam to dream just as every one of us likewise once dreamed. He dreamed of a love. I hope your dream has come true. I hope that you've experienced it. Now, let me, let me on that note, um, in case nobody has told you, you who are single, every one of you who are single, listen to me. And this is something you ought to write down. Write this down. Everything on earth that promises heaven on earth is a lie from hell. If you think that your earthly love, now listen to me, it can be and it must be good. And I do pray all your dreams are fulfilled. But if you make the mistake that so many people make, and you invest the hope that once you find that love, you'll be happy forever. If you do that, you will be disappointed. Because you're going to find that person that you love is as human as you. They are as flawed as you. They are as imperfect as you are, and therefore... There's no heaven on earth. The closest thing to heaven on earth you and I will ever know is having heaven, as it were, in us. The indwelling Holy Spirit. And with that, the power to live, and especially to live within human relationships in a way that we're not needy. <laughs> There's a verse in uh, Proverbs chapter 27 the seventh verse says, he that is full loatheth, hates even a honeycomb, even the sweetest thing. To the person that is full, and you're full, you have eaten to the place where you could not possibly have another thing. Somebody may come by with something very sweet, even a honeycomb, and you'll have to go, no, no, thank you. I can't, I'm full. Now the verse goes on to say, but to him that is hungry, even what is bitter tastes sweet. So I maintain that we don't need to live our lives full. We need to live our lives full, full of the Lord, full of his Holy Spirit. Our needs met in that relationship with him so that we can then be in every other relationship for what we have to give, not because we're needing. It is a terrible place to live, to live in a state of perpetual need. <laughs> I need, always needing, always trying to get something. There are parents who because whatever they did not get their need met, by their parents. They looked maybe to their peers and they didn't get their needs met by their peers. So then they have children, they look to their children and they expect more than any human can ever give. 
And they're always disappointed, and consequently, they're always bitter. Nobody ever lives up to their hope, their expectation. And there are so many who enter a romantic relationship with the hope that they're going to find their need met. And they'll never be needy again. No person on earth could ever do that for you, for me. I say to you, the answer for us, and you really want to be happy. You really want to know fulfillment. Live full. Live full. Live so blessed. Live in a state of fellowship with your maker that is so good that every, listen to me, all you husbands, listen to me, live in a state with him that you're in that marriage for what she needs and for what you have to give. And you have it to give because your cup runneth over. Every woman here, oh, you want to you be an unhappy woman? I have a recipe for you. Look to a man to meet your needs. And you can stay unhappy the rest of your life. But if, in fact, you will be in that relationship, in your marriage, looking to the Lord, allowing him to fill you and overflow your life, you can be in the relationship you're in with that imperfect man for what he needs. And it's gratifying. It's fulfilling. You can be, you, because the Son of God said, and it was quoted by the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20, better it is more blessed to give than to receive. The most miserable people among us, the most unhappy, frustrated people in this room right now are the ones who are looking to humans for what they need. I urge you, have your dreams, have your hopes, you who are married. I, I, wanna, I hope together with you that things will continue to get better in your marriage to where you really are happy but he will never be heaven. It'll never be heaven on earth. Everything on earth that promises heaven on earth is a lie from hell. Heaven is heaven. And earth is earth. So, dear brothers and sisters, back to Adam. I believe God is giving him dreams. As a matter of fact, I suspect that Adam had glimpses of someone he'd never seen before in his deep sleep, which God himself puts Adam in. So after this great project is complete, God has shown Adam his uniqueness, and God has shown Adam there's nothing else like him, but has introduced him to the concept of family, <laughs> even even the orangutan has a mate that he thinks is beautiful. There's nothing in all of creation, in my opinion, as ugly as an orangutan. Male or female, they're just ugly. <laughs> Even the porcupine has another prickly porcupine that they um, find attractive and find a way to mate in the genius of God. That there's someone for everyone out there, right? Even a skunk finds another skunk <laughs> that they think smells wonderful. So there's no doubt in my mind that Adam is going, who could she be? What will she be like? And then it is written that God put him into a deep sleep. Verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam 
and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Taken out. I want you to think about that one for a second. A, a ninja. <laughs> Mastering stealth. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> As I was saying, Adam was conscious that she was taken out of man. Listen, friends, <laughs> brothers and sisters, listen to me. That man woke up out of a deep sleep, different than he was before that deep sleep. Now, I know I have read together with you. Our English Bible translates the Hebrew word tzela into rib. Same Hebrew word can be translated side. And I submit to you that one whole side of the image of God, which I believe is two-sided, in the same way that, the, that God reveals himself through his son, in two advents, as the Lamb of God and as the Lion of Judah. God uses two different animals to portray, in a sense, two different missions, two different comings of the Son of God. And he comes to ride into Jerusalem humbly on a colt of a donkey. <laughs> That's a statement of humility. Nobody riding on the colt of a donkey, on a little donkey, is trying to look tough. It's a little bicycle of the day with a little bell, zing, zing, on the handlebars or a horn. <laughs> Nobody rides in on a little bike, flexing, <laughs> raised sword. <laughs> Nobody does that. You want to make a statement in the ancient world, you ride in on a horse. As he will, he will come again on a white horse and on a sword coming out of his mouth, which is the word of God. But he comes the first time in meekness. He comes again quite fiercely. You understand that the same Yeshua who came to die for the sins of the world is coming again to judge the world. He comes to kill next time he comes. He comes to save and to kill, to rescue his people, Israel, to rescue the believers of earth, tribulation saints. And he comes to kill. And there's a place, in the plains of Jezreel, well, the blood will be up to the horse's bridle. That's, that's serious business. When he comes again, he is coming to kill. He comes to judge and do justice. But you understand what I'm saying about this reality, that the one who shows us God perfectly is the Son of God. The Apostle John tells us in John chapter 1, nobody has seen God at any time. But the Son of God, he's the one who reveals him. Amen. So anybody through the history of the world and throughout the Old Testament that can testify that they saw God, saw second person of the Holy Trinity, saw the Son, eternally begotten of God. The Son of God shows us God the Father. And coming as Lamb of God, and coming again as Lion of Judah, we recognize that God is both very strong, fierce, and he's also very loving. Do you understand that God took that reality of his likeness 
and imparted it to that first man. Putting that man into a deep sleep, he divided him. He tore him in two in such a way that those two can become one. And in that oneness, there is a very real sense in which the likeness of God is better seen. I say to every one of you, there are things that we can only know about our Father in heaven as we see it lived out by an earthly father. Hmm. Some of you, if not many of you, you have a problem with that because your father, like my father on earth, was a terrible father. And he was abusive or he was cruel or he just threw you away as mine did. How do we know he was a terrible father? Because we, in our heart, in our mind, we know what he was supposed to be. You know what your father was supposed to be. You know what you wished he was. It's written in your heart. And that is everything that our father in heaven is. There is a standard and we all know it. And I will add to that that our heavenly father revealed himself to me as my father when I was just a poor white trash kid. I know you don't think poverty exists in America and it's definitely not the same as it is in Kenya. But I too knew hunger. I knew as a kid abandoned. I knew what it was to worry, to worry about what, what I eat what will we eat? I have four sisters and a mother to worry about. I'm the only male. And we knew, we knew danger. My childhood was a perpetual vigil, trying to keep us from starving and trying to keep my sisters from being molested by the men that were passing through. I'm not so different. I know what it was like to have my father break my heart, destroy us. But I also testify that as great as my pain was as a boy, it paled to the pain of my mother and my sisters for their women. Now that will be the subject of our next session together. Why women suffer more than men in a sin-cursed world. In a case you didn't know that they do, men, we all have it bad, but they have it worse, way worse. You know why they have it worse? Because of us, because of men. I, I would point out to you that in dividing us into male and female, taking one man and extracting from that man everything that is woman, that meant the man was different. The man came out of a deep sleep, altered, and he knew it. He knew he was not the same, not as balanced as he was when he went into that deep sleep. He came out of that deep sleep, different, ugh, more aggressive. He probably said, I want to build stuff. Ugh, I want to build stuff and I want to conquer. And... I feel, what is it? What is it? I feel, that's it. I don't feel much of anything. Where did all my feelings go? And then Yahweh, the creator, made a presentation to him and explained she has those. <laughs> you have little feelings. She has enormous feelings. She has little muscles. You have big muscles. When it comes to feelings, it switched. The average male, the average man, his body is about 40% muscle mass. The average woman is only about 25% muscle mass. The man typically twice the strength of a woman, twice the muscle mass. 
I submit to you, dear brothers, in case nobody has told you, that same differential is reversed when it comes to depth of emotion. That's the reason why women hurt so much more than men with the introduction of sin. But I, I want to conclude this session with just pointing out to you that God divided one into two so that two can become one. Three don't become one. Four don't become one. One man, one woman equals one. If there happens to be a polygamist among you, I pray God help you. Um, you have an obligation legally and morally to the women that you have married, but you're only one with one. And, and this arrangement of polygamy acknowledged through human history by the scriptures is outside the plan of God and every single question about marriage and divorce put to the Son of God. He took them right back to what we just read and he pointed out that God made two into one. God made them male and female and he made them one. On that note, if you're trying to be a man with a wife and a collection of concubines, you got a harem, you need to repent, you punk. <laughs> you, you are both stupid and wicked. And I say as your friend, idiot, <laughs> you need to change this arrangement. It's outside the will of God. It will not bring you blessing. One woman. One man. May I also add, one man, one woman. That makes one. Two men. Don't make one. Two women will never be this. The whole rest of the modern world is trying to force upon your culture what is truly from the spirit of Antichrist. And the whole LGBT alphabet mafia <laughs> that wants to take over the world wants Kenya to join the stupid club. I urge you, men and women, stand for what is true Stand for what is in the best interest of humanity. Oh, don't you compromise even a little. No compromise, none. What God did is what God did. And man said, he, was, he said, she should be called woman. She should be called, whoa, man. But she was taken out of the man. He was conscious that she is now everything that he is not. Everything he's lacking, she has. And when they come together, and if they'll come together right, they, in a sense, complete each other. There is a restoration of the image of God in a man and a woman truly complementing one another, truly becoming one, not constantly competing with each other, but completing one another. There is something that we offer to our children and our grandchildren. It is the image of God restored in holy marriage, holy matrimony, in living that covenant. And the last thing we read is verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. I'll say verse 25 for chapter three because I think that's where it belongs. All right. Now, if, if we had the time, we could talk at length about the differences between men and women. 
I'll leave you just two primary differences, okay? I'm going to go over just a couple minutes. Two primary differences. Number one, little boys were made for war. Every one of your little boys that are born to you, just like you, every man in this room, from the oldest to the youngest, remembers what it was to be a little boy. And when you're a little boy, you dreamed of greatness. When you were a little boy, you were born into a cosmic conflict between good and evil, and you knew it innately, and you wanted to affect it. Not so much little girls. Little girls are made for love. They may have dreams of accomplishments. They may have dreams of achievements and some degree of greatness, but ultimately, every little girl is made for love. They learn how to speak before little boys. Do you guys know that? Little girls learn language really fast because it's important to them. It allows them to connect to another soul. Little boys are grunting, ooh, ah, all the way till their teens. And they, and they do sound effects. <laughs> they, do, they do sound effects about the war that they're aware of in the universe that they've been born into. The apostle Peter refers to the wife as the weaker vessel. At the same time, in 1 Peter chapter 3, he calls the husband to honor the weaker. Give honor unto the weaker. So weaker doesn't mean inferior. It just means easily broken, delicate, fragile, like something that is expensive, very expensive and very fragile, easily broken. Men, you are not easily broken and you're not supposed to be. You are supposed to be thicker skinned. Your skin is thicker. It's supposed to be thicker. Your skin is leather. The woman's skin is silk. <laughs> Brothers, could you imagine wanting to rub up against a fellow leather creature? <laughs> yeah, no, repulsive thought, an abomination. Men are not supposed to be silky. We're not supposed to be easily broken or delicate. Are we brothers? We are supposed to be, biblically speaking, manhood is synonymous with strength and strength of character and courage. When God says, like he does to Job, stand up like a man, gird up your loins like a man and I'll ask you the questions. When God says, like a man, he means something, doesn't he? All right, that's where we'll leave. Father, I pray your blessing upon our meditation on these things. Illuminate our understanding. That we might understand that you made us to be men. You had something in mind. You made the ladies to be women, and you had something in mind. And I pray, Lord, that you help us to recognize that both sides represent the Creator and reflect his image. Show us things that we didn't see before. I pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.